Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, this is Richard Pearson, uh, based at University College London. I'm a, 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 an ecologist, um, and uh, my task is to provide a, a brief overview of some of the main applications of ecological niche models um, for the ENM 2020 online course. So I know elsewhere in the course you'll be covering this in, in a lot more detail, but let's just um, start with some of the basic theory behind what we're trying to do here, which is to, to ask how can we model distributions and, and, and what we need to ask what are the factors that determine species distributions. Um, we usually break these down into three broadly different areas or different factors, so abiotic factors, things like temperature, precipitation, soil type, uh, salinity in marine environments, then the biotic environment, so a species place within a, a biotic community, its relationship to other organisms, and then the spatial aspect, so movement, a species ability to move around the landscape, to disperse or to, to migrate. And of course there are a whole suite of different ecological and evolutionary processes that, that underlie these, these different factors. And what we're doing really with distribution models or ecological niche models is focusing in primarily, not exclusively, but primarily on the abiotic factors. We're using abiotic variables like temperature and precipitation variables, or as I say, soil pH or land cover types and things. We're using these abiotic variables to, to, to statistically associate um, with uh, occurrence records for species and therefore to, to predict what the environmental characteristics of species are, so the abiotic niche of a species. So generally we can, we can think about a, a, a generic formula for an equation which is going to look something like the probability of some species I occurring in some, L, uh, some uh, cell X, we'll call it, some location in the landscape, is some function of a suite of environmental variables at, the, at that location. So we're basically saying that the probability of finding a species at a certain location is some function of what the abiotic environment is like at that site. And just a key thing that I've put in kind of bold red here, um, that to bear in mind, building on, on, on the, the, the whole body of theory behind this, is to really emphasize that niche models or, or distribution models, we can somewhat use the terms interchangeably, they identify areas in a landscape that have similar environments to localities where the species has been observed. That's essentially, that's all a distribution model does. It just tells you where in the landscape the environment is similar to where you've already observed the species. Nothing more. We need to bear that in mind and you'll be digging a lot more into the theories and, and, and reading about the, the theoretical basis for this. But that's all a distribution model tells us. But what I want to show over the next few minutes is that although we make a bunch of assumptions behind that and, and, and those assumptions aren't always, um, don't always hold, this information can be extremely useful in a really wide range of applications. And there are a ton of applications that are going to be covered in, in the course that's been, that's been set up, which is really cool and exciting. Um, I'm not going to try to cover all of those. My goal is really to give an overview of the, broadly the different types of applications that, um, that, that distribution models are used for. And, and this list on this slide is, is by no means exhaustive. It goes on and on. The, these kinds of approaches have been used really really broadly. So my key aim is to illustrate just a few key applications and cover some of the key principles. Um, so I've, I've just selected a few applications and, and those first five in red on this slide are the ones that I'm going to focus on. There are tons of different possible case studies and examples I could have selected. What I've done, um, just to give you a, a taster really and, and moving before you move into the details, is to select a few that um, I hope kind of work together. Um, in particular, I've focused on Madagascar uh, as one of the case studies, just for a bit of continuity through the different case, cases. Um, and some of it's based on my own work, not, not all of it, but some of, some of it's based on my own work simply really because those are the, 
those are the ones that I, those are the studies that I know best. So let's kick off with um, a first example, one of the classic applications of these kinds of methods, looking at invasive species. Um, again, tons of different examples, but I'm just going to focus in on, on, on one example, which is the Asian common toad in Madagascar. Um, there's a lot of background story that you can read about here in terms of um, the, the conservation implications and what's happening. And I'm, I'm just going to focus briefly on, on the main modelling approach. But, but broadly, the story is that um, Asian common toads um, were first recorded in Madagascar, um, well, in, in the early 2010s, possibly in the late um, 2008, 2009. But really, around 2014 or so, this, this became well known in the conservation uh, arena that uh, these big toxic um, toads, uh, somewhat similar to cane toads in, in Australia, which we know have been uh, an invasive, uh, a real invasive problem, uh, have been established or, or begun to set up populations in, um, in Madagascar. Uh, they were first recorded around Termasina on the eastern coast of Madagascar, which is a well-known kind of industrial area. And the, the idea is that probably the thought is that um, through some maybe in a, in a ship ballast or, or for some human, um, uh, there was some human transport of, 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 of pregnant female or, or, or populations of this toad um, into Madagascar, which set off alarm bells for the conservation community because clearly this is uh, something that could be really bad for the native flora and fauna in Madagascar, which is, as we know, a very, uh, very biodiverse region with very high areas of, of endemism. So it set up a conservation challenge and, and, and um, I and others were thinking, well, we can, we can apply, this is a kind of classic case where we could apply ecological niche models or, or, or species distribution models. So what you're seeing here is a download of occurrence records for the Asian common toad throughout its native range. Um, throughout um, Asia, as you would pick up, it's fairly common uh, throughout Asia, as you pick up from its name. So these were downloaded just from uh, GBIF, it just shows the native range of the species. And I've also plotted on here um, this record from Madagascar in the early 2010s. And what we can do with the distribution model is take this set of occurrence records, so it's the same figure that you're seeing top left on this slide, top left as you're looking at it, that's our species. The other thing that we know is a, is a great deal about the set of environments, both in the native range throughout Asia and in the um, in, in potentially invaded range in Madagascar. So from weather station data, from remote sensing information, from all sorts of information, we now have these big global databases at fine, fairly fine spatial resolutions and um, GIS databases of environmental data. So what are we going to do? We're going to take our occurrence record, species I, and the set of conditions throughout the range, our um, uh, vector, uh, we're calling X here, and we're simply going to build a correlative species distribution model that associates um, the occurrence records to the environmental variables such that we can predict the probability of occurrence based on that set of environmental variables. And elsewhere in this course um, and, and lots of literature looking at different mathematical or statistical or machine learning formulas that we can use to actually generate that association. But for now, we'll just think of it generic, a little bit like a black box, but that's fine for this particular um, session that we're predicting based on environmental conditions what the habitat suitability or what the likelihood of finding a species is. So what we can then do is for every cell in this landscape throughout Madagascar, we can ask how similar is the landscape to in the native range? How similar is the temperature, the precipitation and any other variables that we care to use? In this case, it was mostly climatic variables. In fact, I think it was all climatic variables. So what you're seeing on the, on the right is a map of probabilities of occurrence for this species from lighter to darker, going from low to high, that is showing where in the landscape is more or less suitable for the species to invade. So we can immediately pick up some key messages. So for example, generally, Madagascar is not totally environmentally dissimilar to some places in the native range, which suggests that there is a threat, there is a risk that this species could 
establish itself. And more than that, across the, what's known as the eastern escarpment in Madagascar, on this east coast, there's a kind of upward slope and escarpment going up to the highlands. That is an area that's particularly at risk of, of invasion. It's particularly suitable for the species. So this can potentially be very useful as an application because it can inform conservation, the conservation community as to where the species is likely to spread or even if it is likely to spread. And since this work was done and, and, and the threat has, has been identified, there have been a lot of eradication efforts looking in some of these areas to try and see if um, we can actually um, get rid of, of this species from, from Madagascar. This is an ongoing, I think, um, conservation challenge that you can read about beyond the scope of this session. Um, but what I hope to get across is that there is a really core use for an ecological niche model here where we're simply saying where in the potential area that the species could invade, where is it more likely to in terms of where are the environments more similar to where we know the species um, is, is native, where, where are the conditions similar to us in the native range. Uh, let's stick with Madagascar to move on to this um, second kind of classic application of distribution models or, or ecological niche models, which is the discovery of species and, and populations. Classic problem in conservation biology um, and, and throughout our, you know, scientific understanding of biodiversity is that we, we simply don't know all that much about biodiversity. We, we, we know a fraction of the species that are actually out there. We know there are many undiscovered species. And for those species that we do know about, we very often have just a few occurrence records. We don't tend to have a very good estimate of what their distributions are. So here we're interested in using these kinds of models to try and, if you like, accelerate the discovery of unknown species and, and unknown populations. And this has been applied in different parts of the world, but I'm gonna stick with Madagascar and some of the work that we've been doing there. So in principle, I mean, the, the, the approach that we're using is going to become very familiar. We're taking a set of observed occurrence records that you're seeing top left here. So these are taken from um, museum specimens and plotted on a map. And then a whole suite of environmental variables, plotting things like temperature, precipitation. Um, there's a remote sensing data here on NDVI, so a kind of measure of greenness of the vegetation. Some information on slope and aspect, which is, which is particularly important, say, if you're interested in predicting the distribution of, of, of a snake, then it, it can be useful to know about the aspect that that um, landscape that the, that the species might occur in is, is, is what the aspect is in terms of, is there much potential for that species to bask and to, to, to um, continue its life cycle? So what we do, similar thing, we're gonna associate the known occurrence records with the environmental data we're then going to say, what's the probability of the species occurring in, in each cell as some function of the environment? And then we're going to just plot it back onto a map. What you're seeing in, in orange here is, is that prediction from a distribution model, much like we've just seen in, in the previous example. This particular case is not showing a continuous surface, a probability of occurrence. What we've done is set a threshold above which we've said, well, the probability is high enough that we're going to conclude that the, the habitat is suitable. We're going to set, predict that the species could be present there. And again, I think you'll learn later in the course um, how in practice we can set those thresholds. But again, this is a prediction of habitat suitability um, where the ecological niche is geographically distributed for this species. Which is interesting in itself, but we can home in on some particularly um, interesting aspects here. So I've circled here one area that is of particular interest. Um, this is a fragment of, uh, or an area of potentially suitable habitat. So area of habitat that's at least similar environmentally to where we've already observed populations of the species. It's of a size that makes it interesting because maybe there are populations there. It's not a tiny little fragment. And a key point here is that it's disjunct. It's, it's um, separated from known populations by some areas of unsuitable habitat. So if we make a bunch of key assumptions, and there's a lot of, of theory here that I'm gonna skip over so as to give you just a broad overview. But if we make some key assumptions in particular that um, 
speciation is occurring allopatrically, that is, um, where you have populations that are geographically divided, which restricts gene flow between them, and over time they diverge and become separate species. This is an area that we might be really interested in going and having a look, because, sorry, even though we don't have known populations there, this is an area where we might either found, find um, unknown populations of the species, or if speciation has occurred allopatrically, as I just described, maybe this would even be an area where we'd find closely related but unknown species. So what we've been doing for a, a few years now is um, working with field crews that um, go out and sample the landscape and actually look in some of these areas. Now this is potentially really important information when you have just a, a, a you know a handful of a field crew of just a, a few people, maybe six or eight or ten, who are out spending a few months in the field. But still, this is a huge island. So any information that we can give that says, well, I think if you go here and look here, then you'll have a better chance of finding new species and new populations. Um, that can be, you know, like gold dust, really important information. So what we're seeing in this map is essentially we're picking out those areas of interest. So areas that look like we don't have known populations and that are disjunct from known populations. We're picking those out for lots of species. This is a few dozen species on here, 50, 50 or 60 species. And then basically just layering them on top of each other. So the areas that we're saying are high priority are fragments of, of forest or other areas of, in the landscape where several species are showing that, well, this is potentially suitable habitat that is disjunct from known populations. And there are some statistical assessments that we can do to give us confidence that there is certainly significant coincidence between known areas of endemism. Some of these areas are already really well known to be areas with high endemism and the predicted areas. So that gives us some confidence that we might be onto something. But there are a whole bunch of areas here that simply haven't been kind of, if you like, professionally properly surveyed amphibians and reptiles um, before. So what we've been doing, and, and this is work that was done um, a few years ago now, but is, is still ongoing, is sending folks out, uh, giving these maps to the field crews who are then going out and actually doing field surveys in some of these regions. And the results have been really encouraging. Um, as I say, there's a number of studies that have written some of this up, and we're still working on it. But for example, in the 2007 to 2009 field seasons, we found, we think about 19 new reptile species and a whole bunch of range extensions. Now it takes a long time to really show that they are really good new species. We have to do the morphology and the genetic analyses, but that's how this is, is looking. So for example, here is a undescribed Kaluma species. Um, here is a Felsuma, uh, Felsuma cochi, so a, a known and described species. What you're seeing here in black are the known populations, but then in red we've got range extensions, new populations of this species that have been found during this field seasons, during these field seasons. So this is an instance where we're applying, it's an application of these map models, these methods to address what are essentially two fundamental problems in conservation biology. What we might term the Linnaean shortfall, that's this idea that for the vast majority of species on the planet, or at least for a lot of species on the planet, we, um, we simply don't know about them. So we probably know that there are about 1.7, 1.8 described species on the planet, but for those there are most likely at least two others and, and probably a lot more that haven't yet been discovered and formally classified. So as I've just shown, we're trying to use, one of the applications of these methods is to use the analyses to try and inform where we should look in the landscape to try and adjust, address this challenge and discover unknown species. And the other thing is that for really the vast majority of species, we really don't know much about their distributions at all. So this is often referred to as the Wallacean shortfall after, of course, Alfred Russell Wallace, who was um, one of the early and, and, and most important biogeographers interested in spatial distributions of species. So again, we can apply these methods, we can use these methods to try and accelerate the discovery of new populations that tell us more about the ranges of species. So fundamental problems that we can try and address using these methods to try and accelerate the 
the discovery of biodiversity so we have better baseline data for doing science or simply for, or for, for, for doing applied conservation, for, for conservation reserve planning and things. Which leads on to the uh, next application that I wanted to um, go into just briefly. So this idea of actually using the models to do systematic conservation planning. To identify which areas in the landscape should be prioritised for conservation um, over the coming decades. And here I'm going to use the example again sticking with Madagascar um, for continuity. But um, uh, it was, um, led by Claire Kremen and, and, and colleagues, uh, got the front page of science a few years ago. Uh, and again, there's a really interesting um, conservation story behind this that um, I'm only going to very briefly give you an outline of because um, the focus here is on, is on the methods. But essentially, back in the early 2000s, I think it was around 2004, the Malagasy um, government made a, a, a kind of commitment before the international community at the World Parks Congress to increase the um, uh, amount of protected area, the, the, the area of protection um, for nature across Madagascar by about a threefold over the next few years. Now at the time, what you're seeing on the map here, the yellow were the existing protected areas. Um, at the time, there were a bunch of protected areas that were kind of already planned, that were already um, on the drawing board, if you like, and those, those are shown in blue. So they are kind of have been used as a starting point. But then it raised the challenge for the conservation community or for those who were interested in distribution modeling to try and identify where else in the landscape should be prioritized for conservation. So where could we put reserves that would conserve the most species? And the baseline data that was needed for that was some information about distributions. We needed to know about distributions. And as I've just shown you, very often we have very limited data, just a few occurrence records. So what this study did was build for a few hundred species, um, uh, uh, a whole bunch of species, more than, more than is, has been common in these kinds of studies, um, uh, distribution models to try and estimate the distributions of species. And they then ran that through a reserve selection algorithm, which is a kind of optimization algorithm for saying where in the landscape the actual reserves should be um, to conserve the most species. And that is what produced this map. I don't want to get into the reserve selection algorithm right now. That's not the focus of this talk. But the underlying application of the ecological niche models or the distribution models was to try and give the raw data that could be used to feed into the reserve selection that says this is where the species are distributed. So this is the this is what information we have to um, set where the reserves should be. And to dig into it a little bit uh, more detail, I think these are, this is a slide taken from the supplementary material to that paper, to focus in on the distribution models, what the application of the distribution models was. What you're seeing on the left here is raw output, if you like, from these are actually as a max -ent distribution model. But again, it's showing the probability of occurrence going from red, which is high probability, down to the colder colors, which are lower probabilities, where for a particular, this is for an individual species, um, where the um, habitat is most suitable. And what you can barely see, but we'll just be able to pick out are some of these white spots, little white squares that are showing, sorry, that are showing the um, uh, observed occurrence records for these species. So those are the raw data, the occurrence records that we use to drive a distribution model, exactly as I've just shown you, exactly the same kinds of models. Um, but uh, for a whole bunch of, of different uh, species and producing these kinds of maps. Now, what I want to emphasize here is that there are some parts of the landscape, in particular this whole area up north, where there aren't any actual observed occurrences for this species. Now, that's interesting because if you're doing reserve selection and trying to actually estimate the distribution of the species, then it's not necessarily a good idea to include areas where you think the habitat is suitable, but we don't actually have any records of the species. Now, those areas might be included for other species that there might be records here, uh, there, but for this particular species, we don't have records here. So what the authors did here was essentially cut out these areas. So they drew um, polygons, 
um, connected, connecting up the outer um, occurrence records, uh, had a little buffer to kind of smooth it, but basically cut out any areas that were too far away from the known occurrence distributions. Uh, but sorry, the known occurrence records. So what you see on the right here is then the, the predicted distribution that was actually used in the reserve selection. And you'll see that they've cut out this area of what they would refer to as overprediction, where we think their models were saying that the habitat might be suitable, but we don't actually have any occurrence records. So the key thing to bear in mind here is this is essentially exactly the same kind of statistical or machine learning approach. It's exactly the same theoretical model applied to the same region for similar species, but interpreted or used in a completely different way. The application is different to what I've just shown you. Remember in the last application, the species discovery, we were interested in these areas of overprediction, these areas where we had suitable habitat, but no known occurrence records. We picked out those areas and we said, these are the areas of interest. So those are the areas that we're gonna pick out and focus on and send field crews to, um, to have a look and see what's there. But in this application, those are the areas that they cut out because they didn't have occurrence records so they didn't want to use them in the um, reserve selection approach. So fundamentally, it's the same ecological niche models or the same distribution models, and yet the application and the interpretation of the outputs were, were very different. All right, let me move on now to, to another um, uh, area, which is speciation and niche evolution. This is another area that I'm gonna to have to skim over a whole lot of theory, but just to show you briefly that um, this is an area of, of active research. There's a whole load of literature and an area that's, that's kind of rife for application of some of these methods. And the fundamental point here is that um, we may know about relationships between closely related species. For, for instance, um, again, sticking with Madagascar, these Felsuma de geckos. We know something about their distributions. We also know something about their phylogenies, but we don't understand really what the what are the fundamental evolutionary processes that over um, maybe thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of years have led to give us these distributions where we have three closely related species, but they're 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 distributed in very different areas in the landscape. So to understand um, why these species are distributed where they are. One of the key interests is to try and look at how different the ecological niches are and to try and relate that back to different speciation processes. Again, there's a huge literature out there related to allopatric speciation, parapatric speciation, and how that relates to niche evolution. So for instance, if we're interested in, in, in the theory of, of, of parapatric speciation, and I've mentioned allopatric speciation earlier in this talk, but to give an, give an example, the idea with parapatric speciation is essentially that species are evolving to fill different ecological niches. It's often also called ecological speciation because species are evolving to occupy different types of ecologies. Um, and that we would expect to see reflected then in their geographic distributions. And this is one area where we can use ecological niche models to ask, well, how similar or how different are the ecological niches for closely related species? And one of the earliest applications of this um, was published in Science, and actually by John Peterson, who of course is our um, lead on this, um, on, on this course and has led, led many areas of, of this research, but some of Town's early research or earlier research um, uh, really was 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 key to, to, to showing how we can use some of these methods. So this particular case study is for um, uh, taxonomic groups that are distributed across Central um, America. Um, there is a, I'll, I'll pronounce terribly, but the Isthmus of Tuantepec um, through this part of, of, of Central um, uh, America, which is basically where we have um, a geographic break, where we have highlands either side and then this uh, lowland area that seems to act as a geographic break between populations that are found either side. And it's been 
commonly shown or well known that there are closely related pairs of species, so sister pairs, the kind of most closely related um, sister taxon, uh, sister taxa that are found either side of this geographic divide. And what um, this study did was take the occurrence records for the species found on one side and then characterize the ecological niche in exactly the same way that we've just shown, maybe using different statistical approaches, but the theory is the same. Take the occurrence records and you associate that with the environmental conditions. What they did was build the niche models based on occurrence records for one sister pair and then use that to predict or to try and predict the distribution of the closely related species on the other side of this geographic divide. And they did this for hummingbirds, for butterflies, and for uh, a few uh, tens of, of different species. And then they used some tests to basically ask, could we use the, can the niche for the species on one side of this divide predict the distribution or the ecological characteristics of the closely related species found on the other side of this geographic divide. And what they argued in this original paper, this early paper, was that um, they were finding cases of niche conservatism over evolutionary timescales. That is to say, generally, the occurrence records for the sister pairs were interchangeable, or, or what I should say is the ecological niche characteristics for the sister pairs were, were, were very similar. So you could use the pairs from one, the, the records from one side to predict the records from the other side of this geographic divide. So this was an argument that the ecological niches are very similar. The niche has been conserved over evolutionary timescales. And essentially that was a way of arguing that there was probably um, allopatric speciation whereby the, it was the geographic divide between populations rather than some sort of change or evolution in the ecological niche that has been the driver of speciation in, these, in this part of the world. Again, I'm skimming over a lot of theory, but hopefully trying to get across the application of the models um, in this kind of area. And to give one other example, again, trying to stick with Madagascar. Um, so this is some work led by um, Mer Mary Blair from the American Museum of Natural History and some work that um, uh, we, we, we collaborated on. Um, this was the lemurs in Madagascar. Um, what you're seeing on the right here are basically clustering of different um, climatic conditions across Madagascar. So I'm focusing in on an area here. We were focusing on an area where we know there are environmental changes. There's kind of a bit of an ecotone going on here. That is the conditions change, in this case, across a latitudinal gradient. We looked at um, lemurs here, and what you're seeing is one species of lemur shown as, as triangles here. So these are the original occurrence records that we had to work with. And then a very closely related species, a sister species, found on the other, uh, we know from the phylogeny, very closely related and found um, a, a little bit south in this other area. And there's no very obvious geographic divide between the, the two, a huge river or, or, or highland range or something. So what we tried to do was, again, apply very similar conditions and ask, well, are the ecological niches very similar for these sets of occurrences? So we applied the same principles. We took the occurrence records. We statistically associated them with um, a set of environmental conditions. Primarily, I think it was, it was essentially climatic data, precipitation and temperature data. And then asked whether the model built on one side um, or, or one set of occurrences could predict the occurrences um, for the other um, species, the closely related species and vice versa. So it was a way of asking are the ecological niches different or similar? We know that the geographic distributions are different, but are they occupying very distinct ecological niches? And we used some um, statistical tests, particularly in this case, those developed by Dan Warren and colleagues, the identity and background tests um, that are beyond the scope of this, um, this session, but essentially they're ways of asking whether the models that are built are, are the, the niches that are characterized are very similar or different. And in this particular case, we, we showed that, that this, this pair of, of species had really quite distinct, um, there were significantly different ecological niches. So it looked like the species may well be actually diverging to occupy different ecological niches.
it's a stretch from there to conclude that there was definitely parapatric speciation. I think we'd need other bits of evidence for exactly from, for, for example, from genetic uh, analyses to actually show that that's plausible. But it at least points to the case that maybe these species are actually uh, diverging ecologically to occupy very distinct ecological niches. So there may be some role for ecological or kind of parapatric speciation. All right, so that's for um, key fundamentally important applications of, of these kinds of methods. Let me give you just one more. It's, it's in many ways the most wide, perhaps the most widely um, known and, and applied um, uh, approach uh, or application of these methods, which is to ask, well, can we predict or can we estimate the impacts of climate change on biodiversity using these methods? Of course, this is getting into one of the big societal issues of, of, of the day in terms of what's the extinction risk, or what are the potential implications of, of climate change for biodiversity. And again, this should be coming familiar now because we're going to use the same fundamental approach. We're going to take some occurrence records. In this particular case, it's for a plant. It's for, a, I think, the quinflower, which is a kind of um, subarctic woodland dwarf shrub I'm found in these parts of Europe, shown in green. These are the occurrence records and a whole bunch of environmental data, climate data that characterizes the climates throughout Europe. And we can build a statistical association between the two that lets us estimate the probability of the species occurring in each cell in the landscape as some function of what the environment is. So this should be, coming, be becoming familiar now. This is just a uh, a niche model showing the distribution of suitable ecological niches throughout, uh, in this case, um, the, Britain, the British Isles, the United Kingdom and, and, and Ireland. And we can evaluate these models to a degree. We can say, well, does that fit the present, the current distribution of the species? And again, you'll have sessions later in this course that get into the details of the, of the statistical tests that we can use to assess the predictive performance of the models. But in general, that's a pretty good prediction of, of, uh, or an estimate of the kind of habitats that are suitable for this species. But then we can do something new and different and kind of cool. We can adjust, we can tweak the climate. So we can feed into our ready parameterized model, we can feed in future climate scenarios. So once we've built our model, we say, well, if we tweak those environmental conditions, say we warm it up, we change the temperature, we, we change the precipitation, where in the future, under changed climate scenarios, are those suitable habitats likely to be distributed? So we can use, for example, scenarios of climate that come from these um, very cool and complex um, couple atmospheric oceanic um, uh, general circulation models, the kind of models that are used to produce scenarios for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and use those to predict where in the future habitats might be suitable for these species, for any species. So, and, and we, we, we pick up, we generally pick up the kinds of patterns that we see in the observed record. So we know that species are shifting their ranges northwards, and um, we know that species are tending to, sorry, contract um, upslope to track suitable conditions. And those are exactly the kinds of um, estimates that we can make kind of extrapolating forward in time in terms of where um, species are likely to um, distribute or at least where the habitats are likely to be suitable. And we have to be very careful here because we're not really predicting the distribution in the future. We're trying to estimate that, but really we're just saying, well, these are where the conditions are that are going to be potentially suitable for this species. Go back to the theory right at the start of this session. We're just saying these are environments that are similar to where the species currently occurs. So we're not accounting necessarily for the ability of the species to actually disperse through the landscape and occupy these areas. Uh, we're not accounting for the possibility that the species might rapidly adapt and change its ecological requirements or its ecological niche. Um, but it's some useful information that can give us a kind of first pass estimate of where um, this species might potentially be distributed into the future. 
And from that, one of the key things that people have done is to estimate extinction risk. Uh, loads of papers that have done this kind of thing. I'm, I'm here flagging one of the classics. It was kind of one of the biggies in this field. Got the front page of Nature back in 2004 and has been very, very widely discussed and very influential since. This is a study that essentially did exactly the same as I've shown you um, throughout, this, throughout this talk. It took occurrence records for about 1,100 or so species spread um, throughout a, a, a set selection of study regions across the planet. It then associated those with, um, with uh, primarily climatic variables, built distribution models, and then estimated into the future whether ranges are going to contract or uh, expand. A neat little twist on this, they basically fed the results for all these 1,100 or so species into uh, an equation that relates the species area relationship. One of the few kind of known laws of nature that we have in ecology that the number of species that we find is some function of the area that's available. So what they were doing is basically saying, well, as we're predicting contractions of ranges, we're going to expect to lose a certain proportion of species. And you can do this in different ways, but one way to do this was to look at the, to use the species area relationship. And they came up with this really quite alarming prediction on the basis of mid-range climate warming scenarios. This is a quote from their paper that 15 to 37 percent of species in our sample of regions and taxa will be committed to extinction. And there's a lot to unpack here that I'm really not going to in this talk. We've written about and talked about else, elsewhere. Um, but this was a classic application of distribution models that allowed us to go from um, occurrence records and environmental conditions to apply predictions of future climate scenarios um, and then to estimate based on contracting ranges what extinction risk might be going into the future. And this has been really, really influential. For example, um, this is one of the approaches that's been really key for uh, statements such as this that have had a real policy influence from the IPCC, a large fraction of terrestrial and freshwater species faced increased extinction risk under projected climate change kind of during and beyond the 21st century, especially when those climate changes interact with other pressures such as invasive species and fragmentation of habitats and all the other factors that make species and, and biodiversity more generally um, threatened. So that's my brief overview of um, a whole suite of, of different um, applications of these methods. Um, as I say, I um, uh, look forward to you having the opportunity to dig into each of these in a lot more detail over the next few weeks. Um, I've tried to get across some of the general principles, but have, have by no means covered them all, but at least um, as a taster. So it's great. You're going to have a bunch of um, uh, lectures and, and sessions of, available online through the ENM 2020 um, course. I'm going to very briefly flag here that there are other resources that are available. So for instance, I've put out some um, training materials that are available on YouTube and, and you can look up and four of these, five of these sessions go into a bit more detail on um, uh, a whole range of, of different applications. Um, as well as covering some of the theory and practice. This was book from back in 2014. So great that you're going to have lots of different perspectives from different people over the next few weeks um, to really um, try and help train uh, a new um, generation of, of people um, having fun and most importantly doing some good science and conservation applications using a set of methods that are extremely powerful. But my closing remark is they can be really cool and, and uh, good if, if, if applied carefully, um, but let's always go back to the theory and remember what we're trying to do with these models and what not only what are they good for, but what are they not good for. And let's be careful not to apply them in, in, in cases where um, we're really stretching the theory. So lots more on that to come. I will leave it there other than to um, thank you very much. <laughs>